who is going to uh, talk to us about the troubling prevalence of apple's eye of Sauron at open education meetings. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Over to you. I'll give you five minutes. Okay, eight. good. You've got eight minutes and then two minutes for questions. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to jump in. So um, let's see. So it seems to me that in a very short, uh, a very short presentation like this, we, we have to have a way of thinking about it. And my way of thinking about this is that coffee you get in Italy, the little tiny espresso. Right? It's very strong. It's very short. It's like gone one gulp. And um, you know, there would be no point in drinking American coffee in a tiny little quantity like that. You wouldn't even notice you'd had any coffee. So it's got to be very strong. So I'm going to be a little bit. I'm going to try to be a little bit aggressive. Um, and the other thing about Italian coffee is I take my coffee with sugar, and so I put the sugar in, and it's always a tiny little bit, and I stir it, I never quite, so usually the first sip is very bitter, and then the last bit is very sweet, and hopefully, you know, it leaves you with, and so my, the last thing I would say with Italian coffee is it's so much better than American coffee. It leaves you with this feeling the rest of your life, you, I, I go back to America, I drink American coffee, it's like, why am I doing this? It sort of colors the rest of my life in some way. So hopefully I'll do something here which will color the rest of your, though you're thinking about things in the same way that having tasted that wonderful little short, intense bit of Italian coffee might change your attitude. So that's my model for what we're doing here. So let's see. So, um, okay. So and here's my little bit of bitterness and, and um, controversy at the beginning. I don't know if any here in... In this context followed, there was a controversy, the big conference in the United States, the Open Ed Conference that happened in Phoenix just a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a sort of controversy before it happened called, that was called, it was, the hashtag was that panel, um, because there was an announcement at the last minute that there was going to be a panel that consisted of a lot of commercial publishers and also OpenStax, which is not commercial. And people were sort of, this is the wrong group, it's not the right thing. There was a sort of controversy in the end. Um, they backed off on that, and that panel was canceled. There was some bad feeling. Twitter people got upset at what p people were saying on Twitter. Um, so this this event kind of reminded me of something that I had seen about before. Um, by the way, so I have a lot more words on the slides. They're publicly available, so, and there are also links on the slides. So I'm not I'm not going to read the slides, and I'm going to leave you to if you want to go to the slides for more details. So there was. Um, uh, there was sort of weird things that happened, you know, maybe open education is closed in the United States because it, uh, David Wiley, who was the organizer of open education, sort of announced he was not going to be involved anymore. So people were saying, oh, it's over. Of course, it's not over. It's going to continue to happen. But there was a weird sort of bitter taste in people's mouths after that event. So this reminded me of something because I come from what I call the FLOSS world. FLOSS is the acronym I use for free, libre, open source software. It's better than just the phrase open source software. And the philosophy world had a very similar kind of weird controversy, a lot of bad feelings. Um, in 2017, it was the Open Source Summit in North America, and the keynote, the guy who's the executive director of the Linux Foundation, got up at the podium, he opened his Apple laptop, and little Apple, little Apple laptop was glowing there in this room full of people who, who love floss, free software. And what the hell was that about? People were, were wondering. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the history of floss and why it matters in the open education world. So when I talk about history, I like to go way back. This is um, a medieval, this painting exists, it's in, it's in the Vatican. This is the famous painting by Raffaello of the School of Athens. Um, and so I want to draw attention to two particular characters here who I think are the beginning, in my mind, they're the beginnings of the open. And the controversy of open happened in and ancient Greece. Now, I realize other cultures and people who know be better history may have better interpretations of this, but I go to the history of this. I'm a mathematician. I like the story of Pythagoras and Euclid. So Pythagoras was, everyone knows the Pythagorean theorem, right? He got, had really great PR. Actually, he didn't prove that theorem. He was a real weirdo. He, um, and he was very exclusive about his knowledge. He, he, he tried to keep things secret. So he knew things and he killed someone who revealed a secret fact of his cult that the fact that this, the number of the square root of two is an irrational number. They tracked him down and killed him for leaking that information. On the other hand, Euclid was a librarian. He shared everything. The book, The Elements of Euclid, is known widely. It's influenced science and knowledge ever since. So I think it, Euclid is my model of openness and Pythagoras, although he had really good PR, is my model of the closed attitude towards knowledge. Okay, so come forward 2,000 years, I think that, that Euclid has influenced the way we do science. The modern scientific paper has a very rigid structure, kind of like the elements does, and it's also very open. The modern scientific paper has a methods section, a results section. If you're trying to hide your knowledge, you wouldn't tell the whole world your methods, but you wouldn't publish a scientific paper today without a methods section. So that's what motivated in the modern times this guy Richard Stallman from inventing the free software movement, 
the GNU project, and he, he wanted some information about how certain software worked. And he said, I'm a scientist. He sent an email. He was at MIT. Give me your source code so I can change it. And the company that made the source code, the program he wanted to change, wouldn't share it. So that was weird to him. So I think there's a, contra a tension there between kind of closed software, non-free software, and the academic world that, we've been, that has been very successful for 2,000 years. Um, we have to take a note of caution here. Richard Stallman was recently discovered to have really a nightmare attitude on the whole Me Too movement. He, was, he has been a sort of a, a very bad misogynist for his entire career. He had to step back from many of his roles. So I know that what I'm saying here is um, sort of giving him some pride of place, and I don't think he really deserves it, probably on a personal level. Um, but uh, we, when we have to, uh, you know, some of the things I'm saying here are, are um, not so great in terms of stru understanding structure and things. But let, so anyway, so floss, as I remember, that controversy in this open source summit was about this, the, the title of the talk that that guy got in trouble for opening his Apple laptop. The title of his presentation was Linux on the desktop. So Linux is this operating system in the floss world. And unlike Mac or Windows, it's completely free, like the open education movement. It's so free in all senses of that word. And so the question is, is Floss on the desktop? He was saying in 2017 that Linux should be on the desktop. Is Floss on the desktop? Not really. This is a Windows machine. Here, open ed. This is a Windows machine I'm using right now. Um, in a weird sort of way, Floss has won the world anyway. All of, mo the majority of silicon processors on planet Earth run Floss. All of the servers of Windows, of, of Google, all the servers of um, the Amazon Web Services, which runs most of the websites on the internet, they all run a version of Linux. So it really runs the world. Um, anyway, the internet's a mess, and I'm going to just skip that because I'm running out of time. So Linux is, so here's, so uh, how many, put up, raise your hand if you, in this room, please, if you run a free operating system on your main computer at home. Got a few, we got three, so non-zero number, but a rather small fraction in this room. So I'm, I'm excited to see. So my question is, so why not? We're the open community and open education. Why don't we run open software? So here's my, my guess as to why we don't. This is, a, this is a screen grab of my desktop. Looks kind of weird and complicated. One of the things that's weird, worst about it is those terminal windows, the ones with the green characters. In it. You type commands to have it, you know, in, Mac, in Windows and Mac, you're used to moving the mouse. So my analogy here is, you know, in Italy, we're in Italy, there are all these wonderful gestures you can make, like so, you know, um, you know, these kind of things. In Italian, they mean, you know, so this is later, this is I'll call you, this is I'm hungry, this is let's get out of here. There are lots of things in Italian, but you wouldn't give a lecture about physics using those Italian gestures, right? You'd use words. So why do we, educated people, talk to our computers with gestures and not with words? So that's, um, you know, so the, the, the command line interface that most of most floss operating systems use is about talking to your machine with precision and not just kind of making, you know, so you're not talking with mime to your computer, you're talking with words, right? So, um, and I also think there's a point in this community, okay, so that, that um, you know, it's about, we should use this system because it's about uh, literacy. We in higher education believe that learning things is hard, we are literate, we have conquered the difficulties of learning or discipline, and we think it's worth it. So, um, and I just want to make one, one of the main point, and now the, long, the lingering feeling I'm hoping you're going to have here is an analogy here. So we all believe, we all have all had the arguments with our, or discussions with our colleagues, but why aren't you using OER? Why aren't you using open re resources and open educational methods? And we say, you know, agency you would have if you used open resources and OER, the cost, there's also a large theme of social justice. I'm not even going to repeat those for floss, you have agency if you control your if you control your software. You know you have you cut the cost to zero because in the same way that OER are free, free operating systems are free in the free sense in all senses of the word free. And there's a social justice aspect because you can control it, and it's not Apple or you know the ghost of, of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates controlling your information, stealing your information. You can control privacy, so there's much more social justice. So I think that what we in this community, if we believe in Agency, cost, and social justice as three primary reasons to use open educational resources. Why aren't we using those to have that same view on free software? Why do we tolerate the use of non-free software? 
And there are great alternatives. We should be using them. You can start by using it right away. The little change of perspective here, this is, I'm going to not have time for that image. So I didn't steal an image of the Eye of Sauron from the Peter Jackson movie, because apparently he's very aggressive at protecting his IP. So um, this is a star that someone scanned. The European Space Agency took a picture of this star. And people say it looks like, if you've seen the movies by Peter Jackson on The Lord of the Rings, this is very similar to the image of the Eye of Sauron, who's the bad guy in The Lord of the Rings. Um, this image is like that eye. So I think what I want you to do is, from now on, when you see people, the other, if you read The Lord of the Rings, as I did when I was a teenager, um, they, the, the, the eye of Sauron is this kind of lidless eye. It doesn't have lids, and it's wreathed in flame. And all of the bad guys, the orcs, all have it emblazoned on their shield. So what I want you all to think from now on, the lingering thing I'm hoping that you'll think is every time someone has a glowing apple on their laptop there, like that gentleman over there who's... The, <laughs> What he has is the glowing symbol of some oppressive regime. And you know, when someone picks up an iPhone, they have the glowing symbol of some oppressive regime. Why, you know, every time you see that from now on, think, do I want to be an orc, or do I want to be you know, one of the free peoples of Middle Earth, right? OK, so that's, that's my point. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you for this uh, great, nonetheless, short talk. <laughs> um, anybody having any questions? Yes, we've got one here and one over there. Thank you. What do you, what do you recommend for trainings on, thank you. Hello. <laughs> uh, what do you recommend for trainings on Linux? Like, how do we learn to start using it? So the, the analogy with the, the analogy with open education is really amazing. You know, what would you say to someone who said, yeah, I don't, I'd like to use an open textbook or open pedagogy and I don't know how? You'd say, well, there's a great community out there. Go, you know, just Google it and look, there'll be great YouTube videos on it, there'll be how-to pages. Exactly the same thing that exists in the free software world. You know, there's a million introductions. And a lot of this, it's a little bit scary, but so is literacy to illiterate people, right? So, you know, read some of those how-tos and, and, and you'll, you'll quickly be able to use them. Okay, we've got another question over there. Yeah, so I had two questions. First of all, do you have the Eye of Sauron stickers to put on the Mac logo? That would help. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> idea. I will make them. <laughs> and secondly, for me, it's, it's pretty hard because, I mean, we run a lot of Linux stuff and I run a lot of Linux on our machines. But I work with teachers who need to see a recognizable interface or I, I have all these kinds of reasons. But for me, practically, I get my stuff done. So, and I do feel I have agency over my machine and everything else. But I'm not sure if me converting personally to something like Linux would help as a desktop. I, I can't, I, I don't have a short answer. I think it's a question of changing culture, just in the same, it's exact, the analogy, I just want to lean hard on the analogy with the open education world and OER world. I mean, we say to people, you know, it's so easy to keep using this publisher textbook and all of the free PowerPoint decks and things that come with it. In the same, it's going to be a little bit hard, but when everyone starts doing it, it will seem natural, then it will be much easier. I agree. I think, but I think it's also a question of, you know, we, we talk about social justice, educating people to be more, you know, open educational resources, give students as active learners and therefore more active citizens. In the same way, teachers should be more active in control over the software environment. And um, so, you know, we, we need to convert our colleagues and and then the, the instruction they give will make a better environment for the, for the next generation. You know, we want truly you know, participatory digital citizens for the future. That's not going to happen if they're on some platform when you know, Bill Gates can decide he's going to move an icon right? I mean, to some different location. Right? That's, that's not true agency. So we, we have to, I think we have to seize control over di our digital literacy uh, in this way if we're going to have the kind of future we want. So I agree. There are t you know, it's going to take some work. Okay, I think we can ask further questions at Jonathan later at lunch. Thank you. And now we are moving on to the second talk. Welcome, thank you for attending this short presentation on how we use a wiki to get research results into education. Uh, my name is Marianne and I'm uh, from the library of uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And um, I give this talk, of course, uh, 
from all uh, the other colleagues working inside and outside the library. Well, Wageningen University is a university of life science. Uh, so this talk will be a little bit on uh, life science. Um, did you ever wonder how uh, results, useful results from uh, research get into society? It's uh, really because we, we publish in, in magazines, in, uh, in uh, articles, in books and reports, but how does it come to society? Well, one good way to do so is to make it easy to get those results into education. Because when students learn about useful results, they will almost automatically implement them in their future lives and in their lives already here. Um, so you see it's going to fabrics and homes and, and offices. Unfortunately, there is a big gap between universities in the Netherlands and the schools for vocational, vocational schools, schools for applied science. And we need to, to, to fill that gap or build a bridge. And um, how do we do this? Because we want to have the results in the education of the vocational schools. <clears throat> now, if you make sure that uh, teachers and uh, researchers work together creating educational uh, material, then that's one way to get the results embedded in the education. And uh, as a side effect, it also strengthens the relation between the universities and the schools. Now, in, um, in Wageningen, we have an... Uh, an uh, a, a kind of great project called WORKS, and that's about knowledge sharing. And in this WORKS, researchers and teachers work together to create educational uh, materials. Um, lost me. Oh yeah, and this educational return uh, materials are published on, a, on the platform of Groen Kennisnet. That's the Green Knowledge Network. It's a network in Dutch. I'm sorry, I'm coming to show you something of it, but it's in Dutch. Um, and uh, everyone, teachers, but also everyone in the world can find those uh, materials on this Groen Kennisnet website. It's uh, structured, it has a knowledge uh, bank in the top, and, but it's the, knowledge, the information is structured. There are pages special for teachers on certain topics, and of course we publish the wikis we make there on the platform also. Now, um, you will see um, one of the teachers' pages, which is on uh, dairy, and in the left menu you see all the other uh, domains on which we uh, make the information uh, available for everyone. Now, um, on this uh, teacher's pages, you will find uh, the knowledge bands, of course, and you see here it's already filtered on educational material, but you can also filter your results on the level of uh, education, and you can see in in the bottom, that there uh, are multiple sources uh, searched to find the information for the teachers. Uh, we have made a lot of wikis already, uh, open textbooks via a wiki, and it's also structured in the top, you see general wikis, but it's also on plant sciences, animal sciences, uh, environmental sciences, and uh, human nutrition sciences. A lot of wikis are in Dutch, but there are also English wikis already. A wiki. What, what is a wiki? A wiki is just a website or a database which is made by a community of users, and they all can add and delete and uh, modify information stored there. And of course, we all know that Wikipedia is a very great uh, example of it. Um, wikis are also nice to, uh, it's a good tool to use in, uh, in teaching, in learning, because it's a, a, a way of getting uh, the students active in learning, because in, via a wiki students can discuss and, um, and um, 
uh, make a project together. They are writing and they are uh, evaluating. So it's a very active environment for students. But we choose to find, to, to use the wiki as a platform to make open textbooks because in this uh, way, teachers and researchers can collaborate, working together to make their uh, textbook and it's just the same way. It's just a community of users making this textbook. Um, there are a lot of platforms, of course, on which you can uh, make a wiki, but we have chosen the Confluence platform of Atlassian. We also choose that because it was a platform we had on the university already. But it has nice um, things because you can keep all your work in one space. All the users are, have their stuff in one space, the materials in one space. You don't have to search, you don't have to mail. To mail. It's a nice uh, place to work together. And Confluence has a lot of macros which makes it easy to edit your workbook. It is uh, good in formatting. You can embed media in an easy way. There's a good navigation macro, so you can navigate through the, through the textbook. Um, we already made a lot of wikis, and one of the uh, uh, recently made one is in Dutch on information literacy. And I show you this, just you can see how it looks like, how, how how nice it looks like, you can add uh, uh, images and videos, you can add tests, you can add, add explain parts. There's a good navigation, so it's a, a good uh, textbook to use in vocational schools. Well, here you see a screenshot, a uh, picture of our beautiful library, it's a beautiful building. And of course, the library will support this making of these textbooks because the library can advise on the copyrights. Um, they can find alternative open uh, material if the material used is uh, copyrighted. And they can also advise on the platform you use. But there has to be more because to get this textbook out of a scaffolding, you have to, to do something. And the Green Knowledge Network team can help in that because they are experienced in editing text, especially for the web. They are experienced in this platform and they can help out to make a nice layout of the book. Well, the library has a lot of, lot of knowledge, knowledge on finding and uh, using text and the licenses on that. So we feel it as our duty to motivate and, and, and coach and advise teachers on using these materials. Um, and we would really like to uh, um, plan workshops in the Netherlands to let uh, uh, researchers and teachers of other fields see how easy it is to make a nice textbook in which recent results are getting implemented exactly for the students in the vocational schools. Well, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? So you talk about oh, thank you. So you said that like the wikis are a community of people. So how, how when you when people are working on a textbook, do you have the students involved who are learning also in it, or no, just in, the, in, in this it's case, the instructional we, colleagues? It's just the researchers and the, the teachers together uh, working. I see. But it's. I mean, have you thought of opening it up to the whole, you know, to the way Wikipedia is so wide yes. open? Have you thought of opening yes, that, more? Yes, I think that should be the next step to involve students in what they need to have in their textbooks. But that's a step ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Now, thank you. Thank you, Marian. I understand our first speaker has arrived, so we welcome Diego. Mohabello. <laughs> That's fine. Hi. Hello. Hello. Excuse me, I'm going to from Valencia now and I lost in the, another polytechnic polytechnic. Ah. <laughs> in the city center. Don't worry. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Mm, that's all right. Do we have a
have a short talk? Do we have another one? Because I was doing three. Yeah, I think so. So I was thinking maybe we could ask the next one, but no. Is that it? That's all there is here? What time are you on? Oh. Well, are you just for ten minutes? Well, no, because people... No, we can't. We can't deviate <laughs> from worry. this. Because people will go from... We'll be done. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Good morning. Apologize for uh, I'm be late here today. Uh, my name is Diego Moravelo. I'm from Colombia. I'm working now with uh, Charisma Foundation. Charisma Foundation work for uh, digital rights or defense of human rights in the digital area in Colombia and Latin America. And uh, I am here for, for present to you the uh, project The Planet is the, is the School. All the photos that you will see in the presentation is in the, in the development of the project in Colombia. For a uh, start, I want to share uh, with you this phrase of William Ospina. William Ospina is a Colombian writer uh, of his book, The, Wonder, the, the Wonderful Lamp, where he analyzed current education and phrases uh, reading. Education shall give a special place to thinking, creativity, communication, socialization, and happiness. And the, the photo is uh, in a, a where we work with two different uh, groups in, in Medellin, in Antioquia. And this is a presentation of the uh, urban uh, farm in, in, in Colombia. During 2018, we worked with the two groups, one in Antioquia, with the group Motivando al Agial. It's a feminist group working with urban farms and uh, knowledge about technology and human rights. And the another group is with uh, students from 9th, 10th, uh, and 11th grade in Fresno, Tolima. Fresno is a population, a uh, little population in the center of the, of the country and uh, a lot of the, of the people living there is uh, working in the farms. The, the idea was to establish connection between young people, territory, and technology uh, between these two groups. But first, uh, I want to share with you a little contest. One of four people in Colombia are part of the rural population, and 45% of this population living in poverty now. Uh, in the rural areas, only 37% of schools have drinking water. It's different to the urban areas when you can see the same percent of the, of the schools with drinking. But in similar situation is the uh, access to internet. In the cities, 91 of, of 100 have uh, access to Wi-Fi or broadband. But in the rural areas, uh, only the 53 uh, of, of 100 have this access of this privilege. The internal armed conflict in Colombia has released a balance of more than 8 million victims. And more of 86% of the victims were based in the rural areas. And this is one of the reasons for the people or for the young people uh, want to go to the other, other cities or other countries. In, in Colombia. In the Colombia countryside, education faces an adverse panorama in which the lack of technological infrastructure is part of a long list of basic services pending to be covered and by the impacts for the world. Now we complete uh, 50 years in war in Colombia, and now we have a very a strong problem with the government uh, uh, because it's a uh, I don't know what to say in English, but it's ultra derecha, very right, right, yes. What is the goal? Uh, explore opportunities to create and innovate in the territory, taking into account that young people are thinking about their future, what to do, and seeing few opportunities in their village. 
Uh, the other is prepare personal and collective stories using different formats such as drawings, photos, audios, and readings to talk about their own experience for their point of view as young people. We work with three pillars, uh, especially creativity with the workshops. The workshops uh, that uh, the idea they had fun while, lear while learning. The other is local entrepreneurship possibilities. I will explain this. this topic in the next slide, and another is technologies. I, I posted the Chimera Local Network is a network for uh, share um, academic content for the students in schools with, without internet. We connect a router with a um, router, a, ser a local server and a computer, and the, the students connect uh, uh, by Wi-Fi to the content. And another is amplify, amplify the question about the future and find ways to resolve the use collaborative dynamics with high sense of luck. This is the visit to, to some local business. The studies uh, choice how, uh, what uh, business visit and this opportunity the, uh, they decide for agriculture, mechanics, beauty and ecotourism in order to find opportunities that generally in job people they need to stay and develop new ventures in your, uh, in your places. They transfer the memories of those visits into draws, photos and stories dur during workshops with artists. This is a photo in an inclusive and collaborative design workshop uh, where teamwork is encouraged and creation of new ways of gener generating content it's very different for them because they don't, don't have access to internet, don't have access to technology. And after the workshops, they create the news, uh, news video in the school uh, by and um, for students. This photo is um, at the first meeting, the plan is the school in Medellin, when we, uh, work with the two groups. It's the opportunity we bring together the, the two groups for the studies of the rural area with the social group in the urban area for mutual learning and sharing knowledge. It's, it was incredible because the, the young people from the Fresno, Tolima and agriculture uh, all the time learn to the urban people uh, how uh, how make better the urban farms. And the another group uh, learned to the others uh, how work with technology. For 2019, uh, local creators and artists were the leaders of the new shorts, uh, new, new workshops. After hearing the interest of the students, they developed a series of tutorials to create new content in the project. And the new local network camera uh, was installed in new schools. And in addition, now I'm working in tests for expand the, the network to the community close to the schools, not, not only for the students. We have a, a, some lens, so lessons and reflections, critical thinking, to understand the political debates on the internet, uh, belonging to a community, the very important for them because uh, uh, we want the, the people uh, empowerment in your communities and a fashion sense of justice, harmony and respect for the dignity of the other, promote the logic of the games, the rules, the creation of content, and uh, another is communication and, and dialogue. In recommendations, recognize and support communities that have been developing tools such as local network, technology appropriation, uh, try to solve the lack of continuity of projects throughout sustainable strategies, and it's important to promote debates and forums in the schools, and to integrate a humorized perspective in all programs, include, inclusive the public policies and bills related to technology and education. The plan is the school is part of the social justice by kids coordinated by OECAD University in Canada, and if you have more information, please visit these links, or, uh, this is uh, another, another photo of the meeting in Medellin. Of you can uh, write our emails.
in Charisma or visit the web charisma.org.co. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Has anybody got any questions? This is an excellent project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. Uh, Matthew? Thank you. Now we welcome Matthew Bloom. Okay. I don't even know how to present this. I don't have you do the presentation. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming here. I am uh, very excited to be able to see such a diversity of voices here in a relatively short period of time. And um, I feel very privileged to even be able to speak at all here. Um, I would say that, um, first of all, this uh, the idea that I had for this presentation was pretty ambitious because my idea was to connect um, the things that are going on in the individual classroom through uh, the experience of trying to connect a number of colleges across an institution, and then even talking about how some of those same experiences um, impact um, multiple institutions who are working together on a project. And, and as ambitious as that sounds, um, you'll find pretty soon that I was um, uh, trying to look for uh, some sort of major takeaways that kind of fit into all those things. And a couple of common themes that I, that I think I will mention, um, this isn't going to be profound for any of you who are faculty or, or who have worked in higher uh, education, but um, faculty are oftentimes very overburdened already. They, they feel very busy and involving them in more work, more projects, um, really requires, I think, additional um, time. They need to be permitted, not just in terms of institutional policy, but permitted in, ter in terms of reassign time or some sort of um, compensation in order to be involved in work. And as you'll see, one of the three projects that I intended to share with you today, um, it, what just, it was a failure. And the reason why it was a failure is because half of the faculty who committed to it in the first place ended up feeling completely overburdened with all of the other responsibilities that they had and had to pull out of it. Um, and of course, that inevitably happens when you, uh, when you, pr you know, propose a, a, a session six months and it well, a year in advance and then you never know so we'll get there but there are some amazing things and like I said um, I tried to find some themes where you know connecting all these different experiences and that's why I was like feeling like I was searching for a unicorn you know the thing that's going to be you know kind of the magical thing that you've got to do if you want to try to you know um, um, succeed in all your goals and of course I didn't find that so but I do want to share first uh, the experiences that I had just as an individual instructor employing uh, some uh, open pedagogical practices in my first year composition courses. Um, this, so just to give basic context, uh, there's, it's not just first year composition, I'm also an instructor of, uh, I, I teach a course on banned books and censorship, it's an English language humanities course. Um, I also uh, teach introduction to critical reading and writing about literature, so kind of an introduction to critical theory. Um, I haven't quite used the open pedagogy in that class yet, but I'll show you a few screenshots some fr uh, from some student projects that I thought were uh, somewhat helpful. Um, these, this assignment basically asks students rather than, um, rather than focusing on writing an essay about a, a political speech and doing a rhetorical analysis, which is a pretty, you know, I teach rhetoric and so I'm, I feel comfortable in saying this, it's a pretty boring assignment to, to, to be given um, and most students don't like doing it and I certainly don't like grading any of them. So instead I just kind of opened it up and said, you know, identify a situation in your life where uh, you, you actually apply rhetorical concepts or where you find yourself involved in a rhetorical situation and soon they understand that that happens all the time, you know, 50 times a day to everybody at least. And so the point is, is that they were supposed to find a rhetorical situation in their life where they were able 
able to uh, apply rhetoric and really explain that in some form or another to others. So we had, uh, as you can probably imagine, um, you know, I did not prescribe the form for the assignment. So they were, I gave them a topic, I gave them the uh, you know, criteria for how it would be evaluated uh, and all of the kind of competencies were outlined. But I said, create anything that, that, you know, express your creativity in whatever way you want. Ideally, choose a form that would be applicable to the audience that you have in mind, which is going to be peers in your discipline, not just me. Um, and so, if you tell students not to write an essay and you say you can make anything you want, what do you think the default form is going to be? It's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. They'll do a PowerPoint presentation. That was my experience, at least. You say, don't write an essay. Do something else. Make something creative. They're like, well, what's the second thing that I was taught how to do in school? And that's make a PowerPoint presentation. So I had a few of those, but some of them were pretty creative. This is one slide. I have had, I've had it up here for a while now, but this is, I show this because uh, out of all of the pre student presentations that I got, very few students, in, and this is first year composition in, in a community college, so a lot of our students are not, uh, they're, they're not as prepared for college as as other students and, and maybe at a university might be. Um, and so very few of my students were really uh, successful the first time I did this assignment in applying you know, critical thinking skills, but also search methodology, let alone finding Creative Commons licensed work and, 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 and properly attributing the, the work and, and, and all of those kinds of steps involved in, in the open pedagogy that we talk about. But this is an example of something, um, someone who was talking about, you know, going into the medical profession and using rhetoric in that profession, like how you would present yourself as a, as a physician. Here's somebody who, a student who was talking about their experience, I mean, they're a like professional martial artist, and so this is, this is their experience. And you can imagine a student like this coming into my classroom typically would be like, why am I learning how to write an essay? I just want to do kickboxing or I want to do taekwondo, right? This is a completely different life experience, but it was an opportunity for them to really demonstrate how the fundamentals of rhetoric do apply in that context. I even had a football player uh, take a video of a halftime, uh, you know, the, the, there's this kind of stereotype in, Amer in, in American football, there's this stereotypical halftime speech, right, where you're, 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 you're losing in the first half and then in, at halftime you go into the locker room and the and the coach says like you gotta you know pardon my French get your ass off that's not French I guess that's an American expression pardon my pardon my language uh, get your ass in gear you got to get out there and win so that kind of a speech has a really motivational persuasive quality and uh, this is a YouTube this is just a screenshot from a YouTube video where the student actually took some footage edited it together and uh, discussed all that impact I even had a student who was a theater major write a one-act play basically and this gave me the opportunity to kind of interact directly with the text in terms of how they were through their characters demonstrating the, the rhetoric. I also had my students doing this kind of uh, applied rhetoric wiki if they wanted a default. And um, this gave students the opportunity from one semester to, to the other to actually add and, and um, adapt what students in previous semesters had done. So these are just some examples of how this open pedagogy can work in the individual classroom and how open um, can impact students in that way and give them a chance to share their voice. Um, same thing I did in my Van Books and censorship class, um, a wiki um, where students in groups were able to look at different issues about banned books and censorship in the United States and that history, and then kind of give a, um, an overview of it. This is, I, I'd just love to share this example because I don't know if you're familiar with this book or not. This looks like a professionally designed cover, but this is just a student, uh, a, a work that a student did using Photoshop and some other materials to demonstrate their um, kind of interest in a particular banned book. Um, and the feedback, of course, was mixed, and I would love to chat about that later. Some student, when it comes to students' experiences, some students absolutely love the creativity, and some students want to write an essay, which I did not expect, but they just want that to happen. When I was talking about trying to connect this across, um, across different colleges, um, I, I kind of ended up just leaving all that out, because like I said, the, uh, we were trying to do a literary anthology using press books, and, but it was, we were trying to find you know, 20 and 21st century materials to include in it. And it was possible maybe, but very difficult. But like I said, we had a number of faculty pull out of it. So I just completely skipped that part of the talk. In the last minute or so that I have here, I do want to talk about uh, what we are doing across the consortium. Um, I didn't really introduce myself. I probably should have done that. Um, I'm Matthew Bloom from, I'm from the Phoenix area in Arizona. Oh, this is it. That's my time. So um, I'll just real quickly. So, the, uh, we, we, did, we are a suborder, I'm from the Maricopa Community Colleges, but in the Phoenix area in, in, in Arizona, Arizona State University is also based there. Uh, we just received 
last year, uh, or earlier this year, a $2.5 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education to develop some sort of open textbook pilot uh, that we'll be rolling out. And we've partnered with Miami-Dade College, which is in Florida in the United States, and Ivy Tech Community College, which is in Indiana. So this is one of the largest universities in the United States, as well as three of the largest community college systems, all working together to try to develop um, open educational resources that are infused with active learning. Um, this is something that we are hoping to, this is kind of a basic timeline here. Uh, you can see that we've start, we've kind of completed at this point a pathways analysis. We are moving forward doing a pilot with English composition, which um, I, you know, I'm maybe biased towards it because I teach it, but I didn't really have much to do with that decision. It's just because it's a really high impact course. A lot of students use those materials. Um, our idea is to focus also on, on supporting workforce development by, by embedding in all of these active kind of interactive learning experiences, a lot of the soft skills that employers in our, in our area and across our country and perhaps the world may be looking for. Uh, so not just discipline specific competencies, but those kinds of, of, of skills that, that are kind of weaved throughout the whole thing. Um, and by active, what we mean is it's, it's content that is responsive and that you can actually interact with. Um, and these are you know, going to be open resources that we can share uh, with others and others will we'll be able to adapt. So I appreciate you allowing me to go a little bit over. Thank you. Lots of creativity in there, thank you. Uh, any questions for Matthew? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is yeah, Bea. Back to the tutorial. I know, but I've been doing it for this for years, and I still get heart palpitations every time I have to. <laughs> and I've got wobbly legs at the moment as well. Um, so, buongiorno, buenos dias, hoy morja. Um, what I, what I want to tell you, so this, my presentation is pretty much um, like a personal reflection, a personal story. Um, so don't expect any big concept, conceptual frameworks. This is just plain talking. So, um, but it's, a kind of a, it's something very personal because, so 14 months ago, um, I, I moved jobs. I used to work for the... Um, well, I'm not going to get into the reasons why I moved, but it involves me working in the UK and a big B, which is not the B in my name. So you can figure it out, but we can have a pint later on and talk about that. Uh, anyway, so I moved jobs, and I moved uh, from uh, doing, in my previous job, pretty much five years of, uh, I was in a, a research position five years of, of doing research, uh, research in open education and the impact of open education, I moved uh, to being a learning developer. And I'll explain to you why the title. Uh, but I remember doing the, I had to do two rounds of interviews while I was applying for this job in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, the question that, I, that they kept asking me in, in the interviews by different people, it was always the same time, but do you realize this is a, this is a non-academic job, right? And I was thinking, yeah, I know, I read the description, you know, I'm here, you, I, I, it is a non-academic job. But they kept asking me and asking me about this, and then, it was funny because then I, when I finished the interview, I said, you know, if I don't get this job, it's because I am, not, I, I am just not a non-academic. You know, I'm too much of an academic. So, um, and I'm saying this because, uh, I, well, I did get the job in the end. Uh, and I work as a learning developer, and I work the idea of actually going back to the future. It's like I now work pretty much in, in course production, which is what I used to do before I do I did research. Uh, but now what I do, I do it, but I do it in an open context, which I didn't have before. Did you get that? Mm, I hope so. 
Anyway, so uh, let's go back to being a non-academic. So I'm a learning developer. You can call us instructional designers, educational technologists, you know, there's, there's different words. Um, what I do is, um, uh, at the TU Delft, once, twice a year, depending, depending on capacity, what we have is we put a call out uh, to teachers within the university and we ask them, you know, would you like to create a MOOC? Um, and uh, the only kind of, um, what they need to do is like, we just don't create MOOCs for the sake of creating a MOOC. It has to be related to supporting the sustainable development goals, right? Uh, but the thing is that we go through this round of proposals. If you proposal to make a MOOC, it's, it's approved. Then you get me. You get 200 hours of my time. Um, and what I'm going to do with you is I'm going to sit down and I'm going to uh, pretty much kind of guide you through the whole process of, you know, how do we design the course, how we produce it, how we run it, how we evaluate it. So you could get me for nine months, which is pretty much the, but the time that we have from approval to actually running the, the course. Um, but one of the things, um, and this is never underestimate the power of your learning developers, it's like, so one of the things, all, all TU Delft MOOCs, we, um, we release them uh, with, a, with a license, with a CC license, with, it, it's like a, a CC by non commercial share like. So you'll be surprised. So this is the first conversation I'm gonna have with you if you're creating your MOOC. So I sit with people and the first time I say to them, uh, do you know, I, I'm, I'm not even asking do you know the license because you, you know, we still, and I know this is, the, you know, we don't want to talk about this maybe, but it, I, like on the ground, when you work on a day-to-day -day basis with people, with teachers, with the students, they don't know, the awareness is not there, right? So this is a conversation that I have with them. Do you know um, that we like to share? So what we're gonna do is the course that you create, we're gonna share it with the whole world. So the first conversation we're gonna have is about the implications of that. So not necessarily focusing on the, on, on the, the CC license, but thinking, you know, helping people reflect about what it is, what you're creating is gonna be shared with the whole world. So what are the implications of, of doing that? What are the implications in terms of helping other people reuse your materials and helping other people, you know, at the same time doing things right? Um, and you'll be amazed at the kind of questions that I get. I was working on a, uh, when I first started working, one of the first MOOCs that, that I started working with uh, is a MOOC on, uh, it's called Sustainable Packaging for uh, a Circular Economy. And uh, I was working with, with a couple of postgrads and I, they were, you know, one of the videos they used in the course, um, it was just there, a video that they had not created. And I said to them, okay, uh, where is this video coming from? I said, oh, it's the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Did you get permission to use it? Yes. Uh, I said, well, how do I know? I, I don't, I can't see that the permission is there, right? And they, the question I get is like, what, what are you, a lawyer? I said, no, I'm your learning developer, right? So that's, this kind of conversations kind of happen, happen all, all the time. Um, it's this idea of, con of connecting. So as a learning developer, you, you work with the big professors, they have the knowledge, but they also have very little time. So most of the time what's gonna happen is that they leave the work to the students. Uh, so most of the, my time is not necessarily working with the big guys, it's also working with the small guys who are just as big as the big guys, right? Because they're the ones that are getting the work done. I function as that connection. I have the conversation with you, I plan to sit, but I help you connect with other people. Whatever it is that, that you need, I'm gonna connect you so that you, that you, can, get, that you can get that. Um, if you think about it, it's not necessarily only doing MOOCs to do it online education. So this is the Faculty of Design Engineering. Uh, we're just celebrating 
50 or 50th anniversary and what best way to celebrate your 50th anniversary than actually reworking the whole curriculum and decided to go blended all of a sudden. So there my role is exactly the same. No, we're not talking necessarily about MOOCs or online education, but I sit with, with, with teachers who are gonna come in with a problem, say, hey, I've, I used to have 50 students in my class, now I have 150. So we sit together, we kind of have that conversation and I am able to bring to bring the uh, ooh, to bring open into the situation. So, uh, to make a long story short, right? I've been coming to conferences uh, uh, in open education. So first it was the teachers, and then we needed the research. You know, we have to use. Them. We need the research. Next thing is like oh, we need the librarians. We can't do anything without the librarians. Next thing, all the students. We do it. Ah, so we have a problem, which is all great. So now I'm saying, hey, you need the learning developer, right? Because we actually get things done. We get things done. We reach places that nobody else reaches, that you guys don't reach, right? So my point is. Let's not talk in terms of tags and you're a librarian and you're a researcher. So we're all in this together. We need to get it done. And if we're gonna kind of separate, it's not. Let's have, you know, let's work together in, in, the, in this partnership. So my last thing is we're actually looking for one like me. So if anyone is interested in coming to Delft and work with us, there's a vacancy at the moment. Uh, talk to me and uh, I'll be happy to. <laughs> I'll be happy to put you, yeah, to send you in the right direction. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bea, for sharing your experience. Fantastic. Um, any questions about this key role of learning, learner, developer? No? Oh, yes, there is one question. If they ask why, what uh, uh, do you uh, answer usually? Um, we start from, sorry. So we start from the point, it's what I was saying to you, that it's not always necessarily, so we're trying to do MOOCs, um, uh, yes, to help our students in, in TU Delft, but also to educate the world. So that's part of the whole open uh, policy strategy of, of the TU. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's contributing to something much, much bigger to whatever happens within the four walls of the TU. And that normally they, yeah. And this is already described and shared with your community. So you don't need to, to explain why you do it. Oh no, I do, I need, yeah, I do, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I need to start from the very basic as in, ah. hello, yeah. So yeah. Okay, one final question, maybe over there, right at the back. Gino. Gino, yeah. Hi, Gino. Hi, Gino. Hi. Uh, just, just a question. I, I looked at your licensing. Okay, I looked at the licensing slide. Um, why the choice for non-commercial sharing? Oof. Uh, we need more time than that. Uh -huh. That's just part of. Uh, um, just, uh, yeah, that's kind of more complicated. And it goes back to, it, it's something actually that has been, it's kind of the default um, license at the moment. It comes from a very long conversation at top level on what it is that we do, we don't do, what they want us to do. It's pretty much this idea. We, we are happy for everyone to kind of use this stuff, uh, but you know, have, that come, if you want to go beyond, you, we still in a way, not force people to talk to us, but we need to know uh, what happens with those materials. But it's, it's, much, it, it's actually something, the conversation is still going on, uh, because the other thing that we have is like, uh, I can't say to teachers, uh, you know, choose a license, because this is the default. So, so now we're still, the conversation is so, so much bigger as in, why do we got, you know, so I can't give you just the one reason because it's just not, it's not clear at the moment. It, that's what it is, but that's not necessarily what it is. Okay, thank you very much, Bea. <laughs> now we welcome Anna Kumasquin and Barbara. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.
so way. many toys. Right. If that's all right, I just need to put this one here. Okay. Somebody left a really cool toy up here. <laughs> All righty. So while we get this open, my name is Barbara Sawhill. I teach Spanish at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. So very, very north in the United States. And I'm Anna Comus Quinn, and I teach languages and translation at the Open University in the UK. And we are here representing in spirit our colleague Anna Beaven, who is at the University of Bologna, um, who is one of our co-conspirators on this project. So what we want to talk about is um, a project we've worked on, um, and we actually have a physical uh, manifestation of this project, but um, we basically uh, worked together, worked virtually. This is, we haven't seen each other in, since the first six time we met. Um, six years ago. Six years ago. <laughs> um, it, we worked together on creating an open resource, an open book of case studies, um, allowing educators to talk about their practice. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, do I hit this? Yeah, I think I hit that. Maybe. Okay, I'll hit that too. So this is where we met. Um, it was a conference that was um, put on by Euricol, the European Association of Computer Assisted Language Learning. And it was a merging together of two of their special interest groups, um, the computer, computer Mediated Communication Group and the Teacher Education Group. Um, and what was fabulous about this is it brought people around from all over the world to talk about their open practices, to talk about what they were doing with their students. Um, and the way they did it was everybody had to read the papers in advance, um, and then we would sit in rooms of sort of like-minded souls, and you would then be able to talk about with the people. There were no presentations, but conversations. And through this um, fabulous conference, we discovered there were an amazing array of uh, teachers doing incredibly wonderful practice, but there was no way for that, their voices to, to be extended beyond this conference. So which one is it there? Yeah. <laughs> so we came up with an idea that um, we thought it would be an interesting idea to set about doing a book of case studies. Um, teachers are, have no time to, to write um, long articles, much less um, write a book. So we wanted to figure out a way to make something that was very straightforward, very practical, distilling um, what they were talking about in their presentations to a very readable, concise format. So this is, this is what we came up with. Short case studies, about 3,500 words or less, with a very specific template the context of their, of their work, the intended outcomes of their practice, nuts and bolts, what are the pieces and parts? Do you use WordPress? Did you use a MOOC? Did you, um, how did you go about doing what you did? What was it like in practice? What was the response of your students? Um, what kind of, of information did you glean during this process of using um, either this practice or this tool or this um, uh, uh, way of thinking? And then finally, a conclusion. Very short, very sweet, um, but something that we felt was really necessary because there was, there was lots of work out there that was very theoretical in its approach, but not a whole lot of constructive, here's how you do it kind of writing. So the book was published in 2013, and it included examples of the use of open tools for writing through blogs, for connecting suitable partners for telecollaboration experiences, and for collaborative reading. It reported on projects that create and repurpose OERs and open repositories so that people could host their OERs for sharing. Um, there were examples of sharing practice um, to support part-time and community-based language teachers in particular who had very few opportunities to join professional communities. And it also had some examples of using open practice and open resources to promote collaborative learning and to involve students in the creation of OERs and adoption of open practice. And then finally, it had a couple of examples of learner autonomies using MOOCs for English language, for English academic practice, and using OERs to foster independent learning. Okay. So very recently, we felt that it was time to update this work and to see what the sector was doing around the integration of openness in language learning and teaching. So we took advantage that our original publisher, Research Publishing, had um, uh, announced a call for proposals for a pro bono publication. So as part of their giving back campaign, they were offering to edit a book for free. 
So we put our uh, proposal together and they awarded us the funds. So they allowed us to um, publish uh, an update to the new case studies. Um, we were aware that openness was now conceived as a wider concept and our approach to openness, which was wider than content and OERs, uh, we thought about openness as a mindset. Um, this wider conception of open education that we've heard in the keynotes about um, connecting to the real world. So we introduced the word beyond to our title. So these are new case studies of openness in and beyond the language classroom. Yep. Uh, so this has included, this new uh, publication has included also a section on creating and using OERs. Um, there's quite a nice spread of languages and also uh, a focus on uh, inclusiveness and a focus on serving populations that are not well served by commercial publishing. So for example, heritage Spanish speakers in the US. Mm -hmm. There are many books which are specifically for that population. Um, and it has also revealed that there are some complete ecosystems of openness going on. Uh, the, fourth, the, the fifth um, uh, chapter uh, includes a whole project that um, has students collaborating, creating OERs as part of a virtual exchange project and then curating those for students in, in the following cohorts. Um, so where are we? I think very interestingly the beyond proved very, very fruitful and it yielded a lot of work of people connecting with existing communities and existing spaces and projects. So we had a couple of projects about translating, uh, translating Wikipedia from the University of Edinburgh, translating TED Talks from the Open University. Some people looking at MOOCs, which as you probably uh, um, heard here, you know, there's the whole controversy of how open MOOCs are, and some MOOCs are more open than others, but using them as an open resource or as a resource that can be incorporated in this ecosystem of open. Um, Twitter as well for language learning, and then we had a whole, and I presented this yesterday, um, our Masters in Translation has a whole aspect of independent language learning through resources which are open and also just freely available. And we also had quite a lot of interest around openness and teacher education, using open practice as a catalyst for professional development, also creating professional learning communities, and this was a nice project where the teachers and the students were developing literacy and reading skills in the Netherlands um, around museum visits. So again, connecting to the, to the real world. And there was some aspect about exploratory practice and using openness as a way of, of supporting research. Now, there are challenges in putting together this kind of project, and a key one we found was representation and representativeness. Um, how representative is this collection of what is happening in the field of language education? We all find the same problems, you know, a lack of incentives by teachers to engage with this kind of project. They don't have the time, they don't get remunerated, um, what it does in terms of their own promotion and so on will be very little because this is not going to be considered research, for example. There's also a barrier in that teachers themselves don't often feel that what they do is worth sharing with others. They feel this is happening very much inside their classroom, it's very contingent on that group, and they're constantly updating it, they're constantly changing it, um, and they don't think that maybe it's worth explaining it to others. Um, and the other um, challenge that we found is that although we were aiming for a diversity of voices, um, in the end, most of our case studies come from Europe and the US. Um, and we thought, well, actually, there's, there's a language limitation. I mean, we are language teachers. We didn't think of, of getting our call for papers translated into other languages. You know, that's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of course, we got examples from the English-speaking world, because we only advertised it in English. So I think there's a lot of, um, you know, things we can do critically to, mm -hmm. to, to improve this, if we ever get to do another book, which we would love to do. Love to do. <laughs> but at least we are comforted in some, to some extent by the fact that the book and the case studies have been picked up uh, across the world. So we've had readers from all continents. Um, 
and you know, we'll do better next time. We'll try and do better next time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, but we do have an um, open like email ticketing queue for all open related questions that the Office of Open Education has access to as well. So we can all support uh, the projects at whatever given time they need that support. And so then um, the work gets done. So either we convert from Word to Pressbooks or the faculty member writes directly in Pressbooks and then we consult and support them and we do accessibility and copyright checks in the end. Um, and then so after uh, several months of back and forth, the work would be done and published. Um, or so that's what, how we innocently expected this workflow to, to work out. Um, but we very quickly noticed that we had a couple surprises. Um, the level of editing and copyright support that faculty desired was much higher than we had expected. Um, in our conversion projects, we noticed that the editing of something written in Word to something suitable for an online environment required us to be really active editors of the work in collaboration with the faculty members. Um, also, it turned out that complex content was the norm and not the exception. Um, and so at the moment, many of our textbooks involve a variety of multimedia and a lot of interactive elements that we're mostly doing with H5P at the moment, but we've also had requests um, for other kinds of things like virtual scenarios and annotators. And then lastly, math and scientific formula were much more prevalent than we had expected. Um, so we've been working on a couple very large algebra and math textbooks, and it's required my colleague and our, our library tech to learn latex, which has been a bit of a learning curve because we didn't know anything about that. So um, to adjust to the popularity of the service and the variety of projects that are coming our way, we're just adjusting our workflow as the service progresses kind of on the fly sometimes. Um, we're also trying to adjust the roles of other library techs where possible, and we're trying to create some sustainability by having a new library tech position that is dedicated to, uh, to Opus work. Um, we have partners in the Learning Center, Teaching and Learning Commons, and of course the Office of Open Education. Um, and we're in a, we are expanding our educating role around copyright and uh, general publishing skills to also have like offline and uh, uh, in time only videos and documentation available. Um, there's been a real need to formalize the service, uh, to formalize the service, and so we're working on a, on a business plan. And Opus will be officially part of the library's strategic prior priorities. And we've improved tracking, especially on the projects that come out of these kind of grant applications. And we've also set up our own KPU um, branded Pressbooks instance where we host all our materials. Um, and we're expanding the services to include peer review of all the publications that we put out, um, professional cover design, we assign ISBNs now, and we also set up a local print on demand service because we find that a lot of students would just prefer to have a print copy of the textbook available. And so this is our latest workflow, and I'm sure it won't be the last. Um, so you'll see it's much more granular and complete and it includes the, the peer review steps, it includes graphic design, and it includes the la latest um, publication and distribution steps as well. So we're just trying to really make it much more clear what we are, um, what we are trying to, what we're trying to do and how it works. So what I'll leave you with is some questions to consider if you are thinking about setting up publishing services at your institution. So first of all, like, will you actually have the human and technical ca capacity to work on these projects? Um, we're just a team of two librarians and one library tech, and we also have other tasks. And so in the long run, this will not be sustainable, especially considering that I've only talked about book publishing and our publishing services also includes journal publishing, and that is just me at the moment. Um, the other question is, can you manage content that is inter interactive and iterative and projects that are variable in scope and have various staffing needs because you will get unexpected projects thrown your way that you have to, have to figure out whether you can work with them. Um, then are there areas where work is actually kind of slowing down and you can repurpose that staff time without having to hire new people um, to help you with the work that is, uh, that is newly evolving? And who are your potential partners in this? Like for us, it was definitely the, the Open Education Office. Um, Learning Center has also been very supportive. And then lastly, a question that I would really encourage you to consider before you even start is what kind of projects will you actually say no to? Because we haven't started saying no yet, and I'm really feeling the need to start <laughs> saying no. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Karen, for another great Open Books project. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any
Any questions? Yes, thank you. We've got one here and then one there. So I would like to take my one minute space of question to hear you more about this no issue. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? What kind of projects uh, do, do you say no? So um, at the moment, I've had some requests for projects where it seems to be this really elaborate, like interactive thing that includes every possible mode of publication that you can imagine. Uh, we, I can't even describe the project. And at the moment, I'm just trying to figure out what kind of tools I could actually use for that. But it's mostly a question of manpower at the moment. Like, I just don't know how we're going to do all these things and how we're going to support them, especially if they're really pie in the sky, you know, desires that faculty members come, come to us with. Um, like 3D models at the moment, I don't know how to integrate those, um, like actually moving 3D models, that sort of thing. So it's mostly like we haven't decided in advance what we're accepting and what we're not accepting. And that's kind of becoming an issue because people assume that we're just going to be saying yes. And I only have 24 hours in the day. So. Thanks. Thank you. I think there's another question here. Rob, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, I was actually going to raise a similar sort of um, a point, actually. And it just sort of occurred to me that part of the culture around being open and having this kind of global community is that we try to help each other and we try to kind of um, make the most of everyone's resources. But we're not always good at realizing that comes at a cost. And you have, we haven't got infinite charity to give to people. And we've, we've certainly found this where we try and help everyone. But sometimes you do have to say, actually, we can't do all of those things that openness is enabling us to do. So yeah. I thought that was just a really important point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah we're actually setting up a, a latex service for other institutions in our area that don't have the capacity to do that. I'm not 100% sure how we're going to do it, but we're going to provide that as well for other institutions. So. OK, I would like to thank all our speakers in this morning session for really uh, inspiring great initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.